We need dialogue and understanding to improve society. Körber Stiftung takes on this social challenge at the national and an international level. We promote understanding between peoples and social groups. Our work is intended to stimulate debates. We try out new approaches and encourage the people around us to get involved. We believe that the value of our work is reflected in a more resilient society and a more robust democracy. Well, I'm taking this great walk in ancient Rome with this wonderful device, this cardboard device, and I must say it's really a great experience. Dear friends, let me say a very warm welcome to all of you to the first e-commemoration convention of Kerber Stiftung, where history meets technology. It's such a great pleasure that so many excellent experts from more than 25 countries from all over the world have joined us for this first conference where we want to discuss the future of history. Why is history so important for Kerber Stiftung? Well, we are convinced that an open and critical approach towards your own history is an essential prerequisite for open societies, for a liberal democracy. There is a trend currently that history is used as a political weapon by parties, political parties, by states, uh, nationalists and others, and we need to fight this trend. We have a threefold approach at Kerber Stiftung. First, we encourage young people, the next generation in schools to participate in national history competitions in more than 20 countries all over Europe, and we want them to make up their own mind about their own history, not just read books, but go to your family, have interviews with your grandparents, um, go to a local archive and do some research. And each year more than 10,000 pupils from all over Europe are participating in these national history competitions in our history network. Second, in our annual conference in Berlin, the Kerber History Forum, we want to discuss the connects between history and politics. We want to find out the history of politics and the politics of history. And last but not least, in our new program e-commemoration, we want to harness the potential of digital technology for history. How to make history more popular, more accessible, more international and maybe even more effective. So I wish you all a wonderful next two days with fruitful discussions, lots of insights, and I will now go back to ancient Rome and visit the Colosseum. Maybe I can even have a chat with the emperor. Bye bye. Digitalization is redefining history. New generations and new technologies raise new questions and open new discussions. They topple traditions and give rise to insights that help us meet present and future challenges of our societies. With e-commemoration, we want to harness this transformative dynamic of digitalization to encourage innovative approaches to history and memory. My name is Fiona Fritz and I'm the program director of e-commemoration here at Körber Stiftung. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the very first e-commemoration convention. Good evening or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. We're so happy that historians, memory workers and creative minds from across the globe are coming together to discuss new perspectives on creative and participatory commemoration. Three questions will be at the heart of the e-commemoration convention. How will the future of history, shaped by algorithms and social media, look like? How can digital tools keep historical testimony alive? How can technological innovation enable more inclusive perspectives on history? 
We will host three exciting panel discussions with great speakers and hands-on sessions, which will allow all of us and all of you to try out some dig digital technologies yourself. Now, we begin the e-commemoration convention with a panel discussion on how social media, big data, and civic intelligence reshape the past. We are very fortunate that three fantastic guests are joining us for this discussion from the Netherlands, from Canada and Germany. Peter van Huys is investigative journalist and senior researcher at Bellingcats, an independent international collective of researchers, investigators and citizen journalists. Peter is a historian by training, and since working for Bellingcats, he made a name for himself um, by participating in joint investigations on the shootdown of MH17 in eastern Ukraine in 2014, and many more. Historian Heidi Twarek is associate professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. She studied at Cambridge University and earned her PhD in history from Harvard University. Her research focuses on media history, and she uses her expertise also to analyze the power of information and disinformation in the past, but also the present. The discussion will be led by Thorsten Logge, Assistant Professor for Public History at the University of Hamburg. His research focuses on performativity and mediality of history in public spheres. One of his most recent projects is called Social Media History, a citizen science project that includes and involves citizen research researchers in exploring the practices of history making on the social media platforms of Instagram and TikTok. We are honored that you are joining us today to discuss important questions of the future, of the future of history. How is history written today? And who writes history today? I invite you all to join the discussion. You can submit your questions via email or the chat if you're on our conference platform, and we will forward them to the speakers. And with this, I hand over to you, Thorsten. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, I really feel honored to be part of this discussion today and um, to be part of this e commemoration a convention. Uh, it, it's really a fantastic idea to, to open up new discussions about history and historiography today in a world that is changing so rapidly and that has so, so really important discussions about how we should deal with the past and what it means to involve the past in our orientation today. So, but the, the, the title of this session is really complicated. I mean, the future of history this is a real small and modest theme for an opening panel, uh, and I don't know where to begin exactly. So let me just start not in the today, but in the past. So we, we should maybe we could just talk a little about our general understandings of history. Just a few lines on that. History, what is that? History tells us about the past. Uh, history tells us about events gone by, about what happened a certain time ago, and in a, maybe in a different space. It's a foreign country, as some say. Um, but also, we can learn from history, some say, about events, structures, about peoples and their doings. Um, history delivers true accounts from the past, does it? Is it fiction? Is it, is it not? Is it, what, what is history? Well, most of us think that history is really rooted in the past. It's rooted in the real world because it uses something that is important for history. It uses sources. It uses sources and traces. And those sources and traces are crucial to any historiography because those sources testify, they witness, they are anchors of authenticity, they give evidence for what is being told in history. They tell us yeah, maybe what really happened, or at least they say what might happen. So this is why many people believe history can give orientation in a more and more complex and complicated world. And now we're trying to discuss this starting from this very beginning. Uh, by talking a little bit about sources and traces. And Peter, I, I just want to start with you, if that's okay, um, by asking you, I mean, Ballinkett's work relies on traces and sources. I mean, they are crucial for what you do. So can you maybe tell us and the audience how Ballinkett is engaging with traces and sources and how you use them in your work? Yes, so um, with Ballinkett, we, um, 
um, there, there are two pairs. One was um, as uh, the documentary that has been shown uh, up until 2018, which was how, how we used open sources, sources exclusively from the internet, uh, but available for everyone in order to reconstruct events. And um, this followed, um, um, Bellic had started in 2014. Some of us were already active for one or two years, but this followed a revolution that happened uh, over the internet, as I would call it myself. Um, I would say from my own uh, memory, it would be the conflict in Libya. That's where it started, where a huge amount of video material from an ongoing conflict began to appear online to such a degree that people who made an effort to follow all these uh, videos and also social media postings, live tweets, for example, also from people on the ground, uh, live uh, photos and videos, uh, audio recordings, um, they could actually have a better understanding of what was going on there than people on the ground. This for me was um, revolutionary. And um, I was at the time still working on my history studies. And um, I began to realize that suddenly uh, we were dealing with a situation where even a research journalist or a future historian who would actually be looking at all of this um, has a major challenge because suddenly there's an abundance of sources, whereas you, usually there was a scarcity of sources when investigating something. And so with Bellingcat, it, it really is um, research journalism. Um, we gather all those sources. And uh, since a few years, not just open sources anymore, uh, or at least some of them would not consider all of them open source anymore because some of them are purchased leaked data. But um, in a sense, it is still old fashioned uh, research journalism, but it is uh, focused completely on digital sources and uh, going through this massive amount of sources and making uh, them available easier uh, accessible to the public uh, for them to also um, for them to see. So what you experienced is a new multiverse of traces that you call sources too, uh, that you can use for reconstructing the event, as you say, is that correct? So there's a new situation in the present that you say, okay, we now have access to a new, let's say, world of, of evidences that we can use to reconstruct events that we are not being part of because we are not there. Is that correct like that? Yes, certainly. Um, of course, um, uh, none of it is completely new in the sense that there already was research journalism. There was already video recordings uh, uh, since the 20th century. Um, but the amount of sources is uh, has become insane. Um, a massive army of journalists in order to go through all of that. So the challenge is to become which part of all these sources, how do we go through them? How do we search them? And um, yeah, with Bellingcat and um, and also other research outlets that have uh, followed in um, followed the same method, it really has become the challenge to, to use these sources to the advantage to establish, reconstruct event and establish facts that can also uh, become facts in, later in history. Because once you're dealing with a situation where you have multiple sources about a single event, they become facts, as I would say. Mm -hmm. I feel very comfortable as a trained historian. Uh, if if you, you're talking about sources now to use them, this is very much what we do, Heidi, uh, as, as professional historians too. So um, could you please explain, maybe we do not have only historians in the audience, and it might be important that we just recall what, what are we doing as historians. Can you tell our audience how much we as historians depend on traces and sources to produce academic historiography? How do you make uh, historiography that delivers safe and sound knowledge about the past? Yeah, thanks for the, the question, because I think it, it points to, to what I sometimes call the, the double politics of history. So there's always the sources that we have and how we interpret them, but then there's why we still have those sources and not others, which has to do with politics of things like what is collected in an archive, right? So official national archives are creations of the 19th century. They're part of nation states' ideas of how they build their own identities was also to have an archive of their past. And we've seen all sorts of controversies around archives, um, whether it is the National Archives in the US receiving ever less 
funding, so it's hard to make documents accessible, or it's revelations that um, the National Archives in the UK actually don't contain a large number of the documents related to decolonization, and historians and, and people who were actually affected by decolonization had to take the, the UK government to court, actually, to, to bring up those revelation. So I think that's one thing that, that people should always bear in mind is that there's always a double politics that historians are working with. The sources we still have access to, and then the reason we have access to them in the first place. And these were the sorts of things that, that theorists like um, Michel Foucault were talking about in the 1970s and 1980s. So these are sort of old debates. Um, but the digital world, I think, has renewed all of these questions for us as historians. Um, what are the sorts of sources that we can gain access to sitting at our computer? Um, that can be things like digitized newspapers. That is an incredible body of sources we now have access to. So I, as a media historian, can look at hundreds of newspapers from the rural US, from Germany. I can sit here and look at a newspaper from Singapore, from Australia, from the 19th century. I can quickly confirm hypotheses in a way that 15 years ago simply wasn't possible. So that has really been a transformation, the number of digitized sources. But at the same time, there's also a politics there, right? What doesn't get digitized? What type of sources don't we have access to? And then I think the final part of this is the question of what actually will be preserved from our present moment and sort of from the 1990s onwards. So Peter is talking about the abundance of sources that he uses. And a big question for us as historians is, in 30 years time, uh, what of that will be left? And where will it be stored, right? Where will a YouTube video live? It's a private company. And what if they run out of storage space and they just delete those videos? Will a national archive uh, tend to keep them? Uh, we know the Library of Congress in the US is in fact um, storing a huge number of tweets, but it's not everything. Uh, we have the Internet Archive, which is actually a, a non-profit organization that regularly scrape, scrapes the publicly available web. Um, and yet some of the websites from the 1990s, they're stored, but we can't get access to them because we no longer have the right plugins to see it. So I think the, the world of digitization, I would say some of it is the same. You know, we've got that same double politics, and then we've got that other layer of how many of these sources will we actually have access to, even if they've technically been preserved. So I hope that gives a bit of a sense of what we as historians do. We think about and we analyze the sources we have, but we always analyze why these are the sources we have access to. Mm -hmm. You're jumping right into the middle of many problems we, we face today with all the digital aspects. I mean, we, we have private companies here, let me add that, and it's not easy to just scrap the information from social media, for example, and the platforms are very complicated, let's say, uh, in, in letting their algorithms being accessible. But let, let me just not go too fast, because uh, what, what I first want to make clear here that uh, just collecting and curating sources, you mentioned that, that happened earlier in the 19th century. We see a lot of projects, editorial projects that build up source corpora to, to construct the national identities of nation states, especially in the West, and uh, others followed later. So it, 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 there's a development of 200 and plus years here. Um, but what is the difference between collecting sources and having available sources and history? Heidi, could you, could you just add something here on a theoretical level? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's, it's one that historians debate all the time. What do, we, what do we do with sources? What is the role of the historian in these sources? Because we're always of necessity selecting which sources it is that, that we write about and how we write about them. And I think there's even a bigger debate amongst historians about which are the archives that we should be paying more or less attention to. Um, because what we find is, if we pay attention to a different type of archive, all of a sudden the history of an event can look completely different. So if we tell the story of, and I know you know much more about this, Twarsten, from your collection, if we tell the story of COVID from the perspective of an essential worker, it looks completely different than the story that we will tell from the official government documents. So this is part of the debate we have as historians, is not just um, which sources do we write with, but which collections do we work with, and how does that potentially completely change our perspective on an event? And I think that's that's one thing that's, that's essential to recognize, is that there is no fixity to these histories. We will find that new sources actually do change our perspective, 
even on events that we think we know a huge amount about, like the Holocaust, it turns out there's still a huge amount uh, that we don't know or that we will see differently if we look from a different subset of sources. So that's something you know historians are always debating is, well, what if you looked at this body of sources, wouldn't you see a different picture? Wouldn't you see um, a picture where actually the role of women really illuminates, um, for example, the development of international organizations in a, in a different way? And so this is, I think, part of why history in a professional sense keeps changing because we're bringing in new bodies of sources and we're also thinking of new ways to analyze those sources. So one obvious way that, that we can now um, use computing for is big data. So we can have a much better sense of, okay, there's this one story of an individual or this one article in a newspaper, is it actually representative of a broader population or is it an exception? And that's a lot easier to do when we have access to, in some cases, um, tens of millions of pages of newspapers. So that's a thing that I've tried to do sometimes and, and think through with students is, if we say this is a popular article about something, uh, let's actually do the work to see if that's true. Let's not just assert because something was in the New York Times uh, or you know the Fossische Zeitung or something like that, that it was popular. Let's actually look and see, was it reprinted? And was it actually seen by large audiences? So is this representative of something? So I think these are some of the things that, that we try to do with sources and we argue about as historians. We don't just collect them, we argue about their meaning and what they represent and different sources, as I've said, really will create very different pictures. And we can see that um, even just looking at things like uh, German history, one new book, for example, by Tiffany Florville, um, looks at what she calls quotidian intellectuals, which are working class and middle class um, black intellectuals who talk about what it means to be black German. And she looks at that through um, the archives of the organizations themselves that these um, mainly black women founded. And by conducting interviews with them. And that's a totally different picture of, you know, the 1980s and 1990s than you would get if you went to uh, the National Federal Archives, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's <clears throat> more than important for us as historians that we have sources actually to tell something about the past, because in our profession, it's very important to reference uh, the remains of what we have uh, and to tell true stories about the past by using the evidence. So this is this one point I think it's very important. And of course, we can learn, especially by media history, if you look back in the 19th century and you check the uh, newspaper exchange system, um, it's not that far away to go to retweeting somehow. So uh, there, there are like techniques to use information and to distribute them in different or new channels. Uh, the interesting thing, I think, if we, if we now jump into the digital transformation age in, in our times, that something has crucially changed, uh, and it's the, the production means, the production means of media change. Um, the gatekeepers, you mentioned the gatekeepers and archives, and it's really complicated sometimes to get information that is stored in archives. There's a saying amongst historians, uh, if you want to hide something, put it into an archive. Um, this changes now because I guess the excess changes and the production means change. And for historians, this is very important. We can not only collect our own sources online now, we can not only access all the, the multiverses of sources that Peter mentioned, uh, we can also transfer it into a representation. So what we can do is we can do all the process from researching to, um, let's say, analyzing uh, to narrating the, the information we have uh, on our computers, even on our phones. So Peter, uh, this brings me back to you somehow. So the, um, when, when the media production, and the, the means to research and to pro produce um, narrations are not only in the hands of a chosen few, and everybody can easily become, let's say, broadcaster of her or his own. Um, is this a chance or is it a challenge for public discourses and democracies or elsewhere? I mean, uh, you engage in that very much. Um, it is uh, both. It is uh, a chance because um, it, is, um, it is possible for researchers, for analysts to, um, to easily um, establish what is really going on in, in certain areas of the world. At the same time, everyone has access uh, to this material, uh, which means that if uh, people with uh, other intentions who are not uh, trying to establish truth, but instead are trying to create a narrative, um, they can um, misuse these sources. Um, uh, I'm not saying they can easily do this because if these are public sources, then other people can check them. But um, 
we've seen uh, situations where, um, especially um, people defending certain countries, where old-fashioned, uh, driven by old-fashioned uh, chauvinism or, or nationalism, um, where they're using certain sources for their advantage, for their own narrative. And they're uh, not receptive towards criticism or um, they're not trying to, they're, they're trying to avoid that. So, of course, all of this material can also be used in their um, uh, propaganda outlets. But at the same time, it is, uh, it can be quite easy to actually challenge them, to prove them wrong. Um, the other challenge is um, some sources can be manipulated. So um, that has also happened. Um, and because these are public sources, but at the same time, not always original sources, it is not always possible to um, prove that a source has been manipulated. Um, and that's when it becomes important to um, be able to distinguish between reliable public sources um, and verification through other sources. So yes, there's many opportunities, but at the same time, uh, the challenges are definitely still there and to some degree are, can be greater because if you're in this field, um, um, if you're not in this field, I should say, um, then it's difficult to challenge those um, creations. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, uh, Peter, you're saying the people can research, the people can do stuff. Who, who are the people that you mean here? Anyone, but um, I, I because these are public sources, everyone can. So uh, that's uh, the people in the broader sense of the word, but um, not everyone is uh, doing that, of course. Um, um, so it, um, people are in using these sources for uh, investigating purposes can be um, 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 can have a uh, reason to do this. Uh, they can be just very interested in it, or it can be uh, their job, which is now uh, my case. It has become my job. But it can also be because they're connected to a um, group um, with interest in what is happening there or with a uh, agency or government or et, et cetera. Um, I, I, I didn't mean to say agency in the sense of uh, secret agency. No, I mean uh, organization. So um, yeah, in principle, everyone can. Um, but um, at the same time, it's not... Um, just like with um, writing history, uh, research journalism, which is still what this is, um, it, it's definitely not easy. So I, th I think still think that the people who actually uh, do um, advanced uh, investigations are still quite small. It's still a small uh, pool of people that um, develop the skills, whether for good or for bad, uh, in order to go through all this massive amount of open source data that is out there on the internet to in order to create a narrative. Mm. Uh, Heidi, you teach at, at the university, as I do. Um, now, now we hear Peter saying everybody can do that. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, he's not talking about everybody is not all the unemployed and retired history professors out there or the history uh, teachers or so. He, he says everybody. So, so uh, what do you think about that? What does it even mean that everybody can do research and work with sources? What about us as, as uh, employed historians at universities? Sh should we go now? <laughs> well, I think what, what we do is uh, we teach people some of the skills of, of how we do this analysis and we offer some perspectives on how that's possible. As, as Peter said, everybody could theoretically look at these sources, but there are comparatively few people trained to analyze their reliability, to put them in context and so on and so forth. So this is one of the things I think that many historians are really thinking about is what are the ways in which we can contribute to training students and producing work that is not just internally facing, so an essay that a student writes for a professor, but things that have more of a, a public component to them. So I can give you one example of, of a thing that I do with my students, which I think is very helpful in training them about the use of sources. And that is that I teach every year a course on um, international history in the 20th century. And we discuss, you know, what does it mean to write history with an argument versus writing things like encyclopedia entries. And as part of that exploration, I put the students into groups, and they have to write a Wikipedia entry on a figure, a place, or an event 
uh, that doesn't have an entry already on Wikipedia. Um, and because the vast majority, over 90% of Wikipedia's editors are men, generally from the global north, I will tell you it is not difficult for undergraduates to find some people, place and events in international history um, that they can write Wikipedia entries on. And so every year we, we do this and Wikipedia has um, a wonderful thing called the Wikipedia Education Dashboard where students learn um, what kind of sources can I use? Um, what does it mean to write an encyclopedia entry? And then they put it together. And what's neat is you can see it displayed and then I can see how many times people have looked at students' pages. Um, so to give you an example of the incredible reach of these students' work, uh, last year's pages have now been viewed, I think over 200,000 times. That's an extraordinary contribution of 100 UBC undergraduates to public history. Um, and then the final stage of this uh, exercise is that all the students write self-reflections on this work. And what's so fascinating is many of them write, I understood what a historical argument was because in Wikipedia, you're not allowed to argue. You're creating an encyclopedia entry. So I finally understood what an argument was when I wasn't allowed to make one. <laughs> um, and so these are some of the things that I think we as um, professional historians who teach in universities are thinking about. How do we create exercises like this? Um, something that's deeply meaningful for the students, which they also tell me finally they, they've done something that will last, that it's contributing to a public discourse, it's bringing new figures to light. Um, and often what they're doing is they're going to the library, they're looking at secondary sources, sometimes ones that haven't been digitized and they're condensing that kind of knowledge for a broader public. So I think these are some of the things that the WEAS historians, I'm sure you have lots of examples of ways that, that we can train students to think about these things. Most of them would never have thought of editing Wikipedia, even though they use it all the time. So we, we push them into thinking about how to do that. And a bunch of them have told me they kept editing Wikipedia afterwards. So these are the sorts of ways we can increase the, uh, <laughs> the small pool that Peter is talking about. People don't have to do it then every day, but maybe once a month, someone new is editing Wikipedia and that makes a tremendous difference to our collective knowledge of history. I mean, those are great ideas to to get students being part of the the uh, their neighborhoods and their own uh, let's say societies as as citizens to to participate in in cultural discourses to be part of the 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 historical um, discourses they they find and to fill gaps of course but um, those are still students that you have Peter could could you please explain how how you think that the crowd, and you re re really much rely on the crowd being part of research uh, in, in your work, uh, as I understand, how the crowd can uh, get the competencies they need to be critical with the sources, to, to work with them in a proper way, or let's say in a reliable way. Uh, what is proper? I mean, I mean in, in a reliable, in a way that produces safe and sound knowledge, let's say it like that. So, um, well, I'll, I'll first clarify that not all our research um, has a um, component in it where um, the public participates, but um, sometimes uh, certainly does. Uh, but when, it, when volunteers participate, I should also make a, a distinction because some of them are actually already quite advanced in uh, open source investigation. Some of them are hobbyists or some of them have uh, academic background, uh, but prefer to be anonymous. So they uh, um, um, often I do know who they are, but uh, they prefer to be anonymous. And um, so um, it would be a bit unfair to say that they are the average citizen uh, who helps with uh, such investigations. But we have also um, uh, accomplished, uh, for example, one component of our research is um, called geolocating, where we try to determine the location of a video or a photo, and uh, sometimes also the time of when this photo or video is taken, chronolocating. And, um, and this is something where you can involve uh, the public. Um, um, it's not always easy to do this, but they um, uh, can uh, focus on one image or one video, um, which uh, uh, or a list of them and select one of them and try to find out more about this. And this can actually help us in our investigation. Sometimes we have so many videos and photographs and we want to find the locations, we want to find the time uh, of, of, of uh, when it was taken. Um, and then um, they can really help even though they might not have um, academic background or um, investigative skills to go further with it. But that piece of the puzzle can really help us. Um, and and that's one thing. 
um, the other way that um, um, uh, the public, as I keep uh, calling it, can help is um, when they submit uh, um, sources to us. So as journalists, um, so this is where uh, it stops being completely open source investigation, but um, this has become a reality. People in certain areas of the world, um, they have certain sources, uh, photos, videos, documents, recordings, and um, once we obtain them, this can really help us with our investigation. So a call for certain uh, sources can also really help investigators. Mm -hmm. So participation can be on all levels, by analyzing, but also by, by contributing, also by collecting, also by helping you to, to curate the material to something that reconstructs yes, the events. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and this is, um, like slowly we're getting used that to this being the new normal. But when you think about this, this is quite a recent development that uh, the world has become so globalized that uh, you're doing investigation uh, with um, colleagues um, in different continents uh, while being helped by people uh, from multiple countries uh, who do this on a voluntary basis. Um, I. I know if something like that already existed before 10 years ago um it would have been an extremely slow process yeah absolutely i mean and we know that from from history too uh, we, we we can't say that there is an academic historiography and then we have something like the rest i mean people made use of the past in in many different ways and modes and informants uh, at least most of the times so we are here as a profession for a short time uh, heidi and you know that of course that um we as a profession excluded some of those parts of participation. Uh, so when, when you think about participation, I mean, you, you already told us that your students can write Wikipedia articles, they can identify gaps in the, in the official accounts we have about the world we know. Um, what do you think about the general uh, participation of, let's say, the crowd or the public, as Peter says, uh, to historiography and doing history? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is where we as historians are are rethinking what this what this means um, and what it means to be a historian in the 21st century on on every level from making sure that our peer reviewed articles are open access so that the taxpayers, for example, in Europe who pay for it will have access that's under something called Plan S. So I think that's that's one sort of basic thing, really thinking about how it's it's not acceptable for taxpayers who pay our salaries to not be able to read what we write, even if they wouldn't necessarily want to, but that they should have the right to potentially be able to. Um, but then there's all these other potential layers of what um, publics can be doing, whether it is um, interacting with us on social media and asking us questions, right? I mean, there are historians like Kevin Cruz at Princeton who have over half a million followers on Twitter. That is an extraordinary new way, and he does amazing Twitter threads about you know, the history of civil rights, uh, debunking, you name it. That is an incredible resource. Have all those people read his books about civil rights in Atlanta? Probably not, but they have learned a huge amount from those new means of us interacting. And it's also a way of um, garnering new questions that, that might inform what we do. We have other historians who do um, podcasts, uh, I mean, there's so many, it's almost impossible uh, to name them. But those are some of those sort of new ways in which um, we as professional historians can then react to the sorts of questions and interests that, that a broader public have. Um, you can see, for example, on, on Substack, to give another example, um, where a lot of people publish newsletters, Heather Richardson, who is an American historian, has one of the top 10 newsletters on Substack um, because hundreds of thousands of people want to read what she has to say, but she also will then respond to public questions. And then there's um, this other aspect of the collection of, of sources. There are plenty of historians who are not just collecting sources from the past, which we've always done. We've tried to find people's private papers, private collections. We've done that for a long time, and we've often then deposited them in university archives, et cetera. So we keep doing that, and sometimes we can find those people more easily over social media. But then we can also start making our own archives of today that we preserve for future historians too. Um, and I'd only say as a sort of note there, that is something that um, people did think about in the past. It's just that it's much easier to do at this moment. There's a much lower barrier to entry to get the public to, to help us with that. Um, and maybe the, the final thing is, you know, the, there are lots of ways in which publics can help historians with the representation of, of what we find 
uh, to through various types of um, digital mapping or crowdsourced uh, projects. And I think in, in some ways, historians are just at the beginning of thinking about what this really means and what are the ethics of co-creation, for example, you know, who is, who is an author then if people are helping you? Um, is it really your name or are you a facilitator? Big discussions that we haven't even really begun to start having, but I hope we will over the next few years. Yeah, and that's a complicated debate, you know. Uh, I, I mean, talking about uh, copyrights and not being the one responsible person for, let's say, a book, which never is true in my opinion, because I'm always talking with colleagues, with uh, neighbors, with whoever, and they all have a at least a little impact on what I think and how I change my arguments. So I, I should put like 20 to 50 people on the title of everything I write, because I maybe may have an impact from, uh, from my, uh, let, let's say, from, from someone in my neighborhood. Uh, to not mention name here, but who's just talking with me on the street. And this might be interesting for me to change my argument. Um, you both seem very engaging and activating, like like you, you take part in, in what you do. You're not only describing it, you're not only analyzing it. I mean, Peter, you are part of this researching context. You're doing the stuff you, you're talking about here. And Heidi, you are, you seem really engaged in, in everything. Now, I have some colleagues that um, tell me we as historians and journalists too should step back and analyze. Uh, just just take, take uh, let's say, a position of distanced, um, a distanced position to be able to gain objective knowledge about what we observe. So you, your position, as I understand it in the last like 30 minutes, seems not to be like stepping back, but to step in. So what do you think about the uh, the goal to be at least balanced or objective in a most possible way? Who wants to go first here? Because I guess uh, it, it's for, for both of you, Heidi. <laughs> Yeah, I can go. I can go first while Peter contemplates. So I get, you know, this is, I think, a, an interesting question that also has to do with the history of the historical profession, which has at different moments been more or less engaged in these questions. I'd also say it actually depends on on where you are in the world as to the role of historians. You know, in, in Britain, there's the the famous, you know, television historians, um, which have been something that, that we've seen frequently over the last, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, really. Um, and there are different cultures of that, you know, historians have tended to be more in print in Germany, let's say, to say with very broad brushstrokes. So I see these debates, these, these have been long-standing debates ever since historians have become a discipline that exists in a university. How far should historians um, be talking about policy? How far should historians be on television, etc.? And I think the last five or six years have renewed those debates in all sorts of urgent ways. And, and I think one reason why they've renewed those debates is that professional historians have become very clear to us, we are definitely not the only people talking about history. And so my concern is if we uh, take a big step back, um, there are other voices that distort history that will happily fill that space. Um, and I could say only, only personally for me in my, my research on German media history, you know, I began looking at these sources. It was 2010. Um, I had maybe more <laughs> negative picture or potentially challenging picture of where social media might go, but it was, you know, the moment of the Arab Spring, everybody else thought this was very utopian. Um, but then even to me, it was a deep shock. Um, to see that in far-right demonstrations in, in Germany, words are being revived that I'd only ever seen in the archive. Like Lügenpresse, mm. Lying Press, or Systempresse, which could very loosely translate as mainstream media. And so to me, it became an, an urgent question to be able to explain to people, this is where these terms come from. This is the, the history here. And, and that's part of why I became very engaged in how can we bring historical perspectives to a broader public and to, to policymakers? Because... If the historians don't, there are other people um, with troubling interpretations who will take up that oxygen. Mm -hmm. I see. So what you say is step in, not step out, and be part of it, as I understand. Yeah, and that everybody has different ways of doing that. So I've chosen a particular path. I think there's absolutely a space for historians who say, you know, we need a, a sort of slow food movement for history where we really take a big step back 
we contemplate, we try to understand broader trends. We don't react too much to the present because then we may miss some of these deeper trends that we really only come to through uh, a more solitary contemplation. So I guess my plea is more for us to be accepting of the many different ways that we can write history, that we can engage in the present. And that, that that's really quite important. There isn't sort of the one model, which is everyone writes an op-ed for, you know, Washington Post made by history, or everybody has a, a Twitter account, uh, because there are different ways in which each one of us can engage, but that we actually reflect a little bit on that. We don't just write for peer-reviewed journals because that's what the bureaucratic processes tell us to do. We spend some time thinking about why are we making these choices and, and what do they mean. Mm -hmm. um, before I give to, the word to Peter, uh, Peter uh, I just want to remind the audience that you can post your questions in the chat or you can send an email to ecommemoration at kerberstiftung.de. Please uh, if, feel free to, to ask everything you like. I can just uh, ask Heidi and Peter for you send us your questions and, and they will be here. Peter, um, I, I want to build a bridge here. Maybe that's easier than to explain what you do, the, the, the uh, let's say, goal of neutral objective journalism. If, if you think about your own work on MH17, can you explain how objective research in that, uh, let's say, in that area possibly can be? How, how did you work there? How, how did you engage? So um, it's um, relevant question because our objectivity is constantly questions because we work on such uh, high profile cases, uh, crimes between states uh, that are often, um, that often go unpunished and often also uh, even without there being a court case or anything like that. With the MH17 case, we do have a court case, uh, but it's one in absentia and not recognized by um, uh, by Russia in this case. And our um, objectivity is constantly questions because um, they will say you have a bias, you have um, um, you, you don't investigate uh, other certain topics that uh, are uh, similar uh, uh, similar crimes that are committed by, uh, for example, U US government, but um, you don't investigate this. But actually our challenge is to actually uh, certainly uh, do that um, and people we notice that people say that even when we are uh, investigating also crimes committed by democratic states um, people will um, often uh, allege, allege that that's not the case but those are the people who try to um, question our objectivity um, as, a, as a form of defense they have a reason to do that but uh, for academics who take our work seriously, they do notice that we uh, don't um, turn a blind eye to um, certain crimes or um, um, investigating tasks from other parties that are um, guilty of something. So when it comes to MH17, um, it became quite early, it qu became already uh, quite clear uh, which side was behind this uh, massive tragedy. Um, but then at the same time, you realize that there's suddenly a massive propaganda war going on. And at the same time, war was still going on. Um, the war with uh, Russia and Ukraine was at its fiercest year that MH17 got shut down. And in the half year after uh, it happened, uh, this was actually the, the, the period in which there was more warfare than ever. So um, the challenges were uh, very uh, big in the sense that people will constantly question your objectivity and, um, um, and you see a certain truth, but at the same time, you also um, need to uh, take a step back as the two of you have mentioned and not let yourself be driven by um, a too activist tone. Don't, uh, become part of this war. Um, don't become um, a participant in the conflict. Even when you uh, see that one party is victim, um, no, you're a journalist. You're supposed to be um, independent. And that's um, that, that can be challenging, but at the same time, I, um, we've accomplished this, I think. And it's also possible because um, I'm not an independent uh, investigator in the sense I'm not a one-man army. It's always been a team 
and uh, people within this team have different opinions and that has been allowed. Um, not everyone is uh, liberal left wing as some people think at Bellingcat, that's certainly not the case. So um, yeah, this is a, 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 I'm not sure if I've actually answered your question this way um, uh, because um, the question was, um, how do you retain objectivity? But um, it's the same as always. Don't let your emotions um, uh, guide you too much here. You, um, you, and, and for me, uh, having background in history as a investigative journalism journalist has really helped me because um, um, I uh, put things in perspective. When I notice that some people investigating MH17 are very emotional, I remind them like, oh, this is not the first uh, accidental shootdown of a passenger aircraft. This has happened before. In fact, even the US has, has uh, shot down a passenger plane once. Um, circumstances were different and they eventually admitted this, but it happened. So as a, as, as a uh, yeah, with, with my background in history, I stand out in, uh, with my colleagues uh, who all have a different field of, of, of they are trained either as, as, as journalists or as academics or as uh, ICT. It's very diverse. And I always look at things from a historical perspective as well, also in order to stay sane, as I would say it. <laughs> I mean, what, what you say here is that you're trying to be as objective as po possible, that you have a professional um, perspective on how to do the research but on the other hand you are still engaged in information and propaganda wars you're still part of um, psyops or, or other things so um, can can you explain especially maybe maybe on the example of MH17 how the reaction actually was you, you said it in, in more or less in a, in a meta narrative but what were the actual reactions that you got and how much do you think is this connected to propaganda well, we're experiencing a lot of pressure from the um, Russian government right now. Uh, recently, we were declared a foreign agent as uh, the new law is in Russia, um, which they uh, uh, mostly labeled for Russian journalists, but people active in Russia. But now, for some reason, we are actually declared a foreign agent organization, even though we don't have offices there. We don't actually have people on the ground there. We never go there. Um, I would not say that this is the result of our MH, MH17 investigation. Um, it was uh, part of that, but eventually it was especially the cases of the poisoning of Alexei Novani and other um, activists in, in Russia with, with Novichok. This, I think, really um, stepped things up. This is when the Russian leadership, including Vladimir Putin himself, actually had to respond to one of our investigations one of our investigations. Um, so that's um, the, the, the newest development, but um, in all those years since MH17, which was shut down, which is already quite a long time ago because it happened in 2014, um, we've been under constant um, um, attack by uh, small armies of trolls, I would say. Um, well, right now I'm actually exaggerating. I need to um, correct this. They are, are constantly challenging our objectivity, trying to find um, errors in our investigations and trying to um, make those bigger. And there's actually professionals behind this. So I would not say that there's a massive army of trolls in there. Let me correct myself there. That's an exaggeration. But there are definitely people after us trying to smear us, trying to find errors in our um, reporting and trying to um, exploit that to their uh, advantage. Um, and um, that can be um, very challenging because on the one hand, you need to always admit when you make a small error, you need to be able to admit this as an investigator. Uh, but at the same time, um, if you don't do this, if you make a mistake there, if you don't properly fix something, uh, that can really have negative consequences. So. The, 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 the challenge is uh, how we experience uh, um, um, this is that um, uh, we are constantly being followed in the sense our work is constantly being tested. Uh, they are trying to find weaknesses in our investigations and we don't get away with it. That's our lesson now. We can't make mistakes uh, or uh, pretend that we 
uh, never make a mistake. If we do make, a, a, if there's a flaw in our argument, we have to fix it. Um, so, yes. Thank you, Peter. We, we have actually we have a question from the audience. I want to connect that, Heidi, uh, with a question to you. Uh, how has propaganda changed in the information age? I mean, you you know a lot about that. Maybe you could just draw a, a few lines. And I mean, we have now we have an actual account here how propaganda is actually working today. But how did it change? Are there differences? Can you see similarities? Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, even the, the term propaganda and the way we use it um, changed as a result of history. So, you know, propaganda originally means just to propagate the faith, right? Something used by the Catholic Church and others. And it's really in World War One around that period that we start to get the meaning we have today, which is something that is, you know, false, negative, usually it's used to describe other people, uh, not yourself. Um, but the interwar period, which I've studied extensively, <coughs> excuse me, is a period where there's actually fights over this. Is propaganda good or bad? Um, could there be moments where it's actually useful to persuade your population? So the man who is known as the father of public relations, Edward Bernays, actually argues that propaganda is good. I mean, he's also uh, involved in a lot of US government propaganda himself. Um, but in the end, you know, we've ended up with the, the definition where propaganda is something bad. But I think what's, what's important about this longer history that I've written about is that um, states have long been engaged in this in different ways. Um, they have long tried to use new types of technology like wireless or radio to spread particular narratives about themselves or to try and put more news about themselves into other places directly without it being filtered via other countries. So a lot of the dynamics that, that Peter describes, they have... Some aspects that are new, undoubtedly, but the sort of underlying dynamics, the fact that, that information is something that states see as important for their geopolitics or their economic standing or their cultural standing in the world, that's something that's at least a, a century old. So what I try to do in my history is to explain that because it's actually something we need to understand. Um, there were periods of time where information wasn't that important to states. And you can trace in the archives, for example, how it's really around the turn of the 20th century that for German elites of all political stripes, industrialists, journalists, academics, it's around 1900 that they come to see information and information warfare, if you want to call it that, or propaganda as something that, that's crucial to invest in, to investigate and to examine. So what, what Peter describes, the exact dynamics differ over the course of the last century. But this is really, I think, the period of time when we can think about this as, as truly important. Um, what has changed in the digital age? Of course, um, some things have changed, including that it's often easier now to trace when a state is involved, right? <laughs> it took a century and me digging in the archives to find many of the things that I'm describing to you. Um, but actually, the sort of open source nature of much of what we describe mean that we can often attribute um, things to a state um, or to other actors much more swiftly than we did in the past. So long answer, cut short. Um, the specifics are different, but the underlying dynamics of states being involved in information, seeking to discredit in different ways, those are broader dynamics of um, geopolitics and information that we've seen for at least a century. It is a feature of the international system that we um, see historically, and so we need to figure out how to grapple with. Mm. Do you see a specific responsibility of historians that is different from those like uh, Peter's? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think there are. Uh, in, actually, yeah. Excuse me. Actually, it's actually it's from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, audience member. No, it's a very good question um, because uh, I think it goes back to the question of who who are we responding to and how are we doing that. So sometimes what we do as as historians is we we do what Peter described, which is we we provide context. So we give a sense of this new event that people are emotional about. Is this something that's truly new um, or is it something we've seen before in different ways? And sometimes historians bring that knowledge to bear, right? Like all of a sudden um, the pandemic breaks out and it turns out people with knowledge of past pandemics are incredibly important. Um, and these people might have been working on something that others thought was esoteric. I know because I was one of them. <laughs> Nobody was really as interested in the history of health communications before the COVID pandemic came along, right? And that's part of what we do as historians is we're not always reacting to whatever is the latest news. We're investigating what matters to us and then suddenly it turns out it is deeply important and we can provide a broader context so not just has this happened before but it also helps us to diagnose why things are as they are 
So, for example, is the problem here something that's structural? Is it long-standing, um, or is it something that's genuinely new? Which is, of course, absolutely possible as well. And I think that can be some of the the analysis that historians bring to the table. And here, I'm talking mainly about us, you know, facing towards the media or talking towards policymakers. So, in the specific example of what I deal with a lot, which is about um, internet governance, social media platforms. Often policymakers or others will say, X thing is unprecedented. And I will say, I'm, I'm really sorry, but actually there's this historical example of this occurring. Here's how people react at the time. Um, here's the policy solutions they suggested. This is how it unfolded. I'm not saying that's exactly how it will happen now, um, but this is just so that you know that, that these are actually things we've, we've grappled with in the past. Or sometimes I'll say, no, you're right. This particular aspect is, is actually quite unprecedented. And these are some of the things that the historians can do that are, I think, a little bit different than, than what Peter does. So what historians can do is establishing facts that uh, have new information contained to engage into contemporary discourse. Yeah, exactly. And we can also, I guess, another thing that we do also is bring new voices to the table. Um, and maybe I'll give one specific example of, of a thing that we can do as well is, is myth busting. So, you know, one, one thing that can sometimes happen when people look at the challenges of our contemporary social media universe is to say, you know, imply the world we really need is, you know, the media world of the 1970s, 1980s, right? That's what we really need because newspapers could make profit and, you know, everybody believed in truth and so on. Um, and what I can say is, you know, that, that's a golden age nostalgia. There were a lot of things that didn't, didn't function about that era, including um, who was able to write, which voices did we hear, what types of sources were accessible, how did newspapers make money. Um, look, here were the fights people were having about news. This wasn't an era actually where everybody agreed in the way that you think. So I've often called this, you know, this is a golden age nostalgia, and sometimes that then ends up informing policy in problematic ways because it's based on a misreading of the past that people think they want to return to and if we as historians can say well listen this is as far as we know what this past actually looked like so what you think you're returning to is not what it actually was and, and that can be very important because that kind of nostalgia sometimes really does inform what policymakers do so we we play an important role as, as historians and sometimes that means translating our insights, right? We cannot expect uh, a policymaker to read a 300 page book. We need to put it into a thousand words, 2000 words, 3000 words, um, but, but it genuinely can be uh, very important. Um, if, if I can quickly um, respond, I, I just wanted to say that I agree with Heidi because I've gotten into research uh, journalism instead of continuing with um, history. And um, what I, um, cannot do, um, at least not within um, my uh, work capacity, is to go very far back. Uh, when I go too far back, my colleagues will say, oh, hey, that's too, that's too long ago. But um, we deal with conflicts and issues. And what I always notice with my mindset, as, as, as having been trained as a historian, and still, as I would uh, say myself, thinking like a historian, is that there's a legacy to every conflict that is out there. There's, um, um, I can't think of a single conflict right now in the world that we pay attention to that doesn't have a very long history to it. So, um, or at least partially. So um, that is definitely still a task for uh, historians uh, that I always, uh, um, and that I hope that will, uh, that historians will, um, just like Heidi recognized that it's really important uh, that uh, that their job is actually really important for this reason. Yeah. I mean, we talk a lot about historians and journalists and research and narrating stuff and uh, gaining sources and putting them or curating them. But actually we live in times in which people can feel themselves being part of historical events or of events that they think should be historical in some way and uh, credit it like that in the future. So, uh, and it, you can see that, especially on social media. So if it, when, when, when you think about uh, the Trumpies going to the Capitol, uh, this is like, we, we are part of a historical moment and we have to get back our stolen boat. So this is why we document ourselves while doing the stuff that we do. Uh, Peter, how, how does um, social media itself, which is a live medium, we, we can just chat while doing stuff with our handheld devices. How does social media itself change the, the dynamics of events? 
Um, it is how you've um, said it. Uh, because of um, the existence of social media, um, there's um, in certain societies, this is actually only encouraging polarization, um, the forming of two groups, opponents, uh, and only wanting to see one part of the news and not the other. People uh, don't read newspapers anymore. They don't watch um, the regular news channels anymore. They choose their own channels. So um, these challenges are certainly there. Um, and, um, but what can I say? Um, I also noticed that in democratic societies um, that are not already riddled with some kind of conflict, um, this isn't uh, growing as fast. So it, it, it's really, it, I, I would say the social media themselves is not to blame. It's usually already an existing conflict uh, that is now um, um, developing in new ways uh, because of people uh, having so much, uh, it's so much easier for big groups to organize, to do joint, uh, to, to, to participate in, in protests and actions, etc. cetera. So, um, um, and, but part of it, um, as some would say, social media is definitely also contributing to, for example, conspiracists gathering and forming actually really big groups, as we are seeing now also in democratic states where there is no, um, where there was no inner conflict, where we see that their voices are starting to get louder and louder and their actions are starting to get uh, bigger and uh, perhaps more violent. So yeah, that's a road where we are not entirely sure yet where it's going uh, because we don't, it's, it's difficult to predict our social media um, platforms going to enforce uh, stricter moderation and um, will that apply to all of them or will that simply result in, in there being more social media platforms that are outside of moderation? So um, I don't have all the answers there yet because that's a history that is process. yet to be written. Yeah, and maybe if I can jump in very quickly, I mean, I think what Peter raised, these are a whole bunch of research questions that not so much historians, but communication scholars, political scientists and others are actually looking into, right? So this deeper question of, um, social media and polarization, and some scholars like Daniel Kreese and Shannon McGregor have argued, well, actually, maybe we need to look at this, at least in the US, through a different lens, which is that you can't understand polarization without understanding race. And these are, you know, these are questions that are inherent in the founding of the United States as a country in different ways. And so maybe there are other lenses to look at this and to think about, does social media exacerbate that in certain ways? Um, anyway, just to say there's a whole body of research where we're still trying to get into that, um, those broader societal questions and the influence of social media. And then there's the, the other question on top of that, which is what about the different dynamics of different platforms, right? Um, something that, that's known in that literature as affordances, meaning what does a platform allow you to do, right? Can you put up a video like on YouTube or um, is it a short thing like on TikTok? Um, how do you find people? Is it a thread like on Twitter? So, um, to give you one example of a study that I think came out basically yesterday was doing a big multi-country survey and found that people who were on Twitter, um, their beliefs in conspiracy theories actually decreased slightly, whereas if they were using Facebook, WhatsApp and Instagram, they went up slightly. So we're actually, I think, in this research, we're at the a very forefront here of really trying to understand these dynamics, figure out what's going on. Other investigative journalism outlets are even telling us, you know, how are these platforms really moderating? Um, we're at we're at a stage where as, as outside researchers, it's quite hard for us to understand the dynamics of what's going on within those platforms, um, which then in turn leads to researchers saying, well, how do we get more transparency, right? The sort of open source investigations that, that Peter can do, and this is my final thought, they rely on um, how platforms moderate. Because if they moderate and delete uh, videos and things like that, uh, before they're even uploaded, then you lose a whole bunch of open source material that then would have to be uh, emailed to someone like Peter directly. So um, that does that contribute to polarization? Um, these are all big questions, and, and that's part of why um, I do a lot of work with media and communication scholars who are trying to figure out um, what can we investigate, how we can get into these questions and really give um, scholarly answers, because I think these are obviously some of the biggest questions of our contemporary society. Yes, and they also have a materialistic uh, layer because, uh, as we know, those platforms are not very interested in having less polarization and having less discussion because 
what discussion and polarization produces is content and content can be analyzed for the let's say uh, platform capitalistic needs so uh, there's an economic interest in many information and in and let's say or squirrel and uh, quarrel and whatever been among the users so it's it's interesting to see that we have different interests here uh, that that need to be regulated in some way or another and i guess this is what you're saying that regulation is the most important discussion we have to um, face in the near future but without just killing all the systems that provide the sources that peter needs to do his work yeah it's a very complex dynamic because sometimes the instinct has been to say this the solution is to delete things um, but as we see from an investigation yesterday about the types of organizations that uh, and people that, that facebook lists for deletion there are all sorts of um troubling ways in which that that seems to export a u.s vision uh, of the world including um basically taking the the terrorism list from the the george w bush administration and then applying that globally um, and it's led to some some pretty egregious errors around content moderation in other parts of the world. So, um, but we only know that because of a leaked, uh, a leaked list. So this is part of why um, the European Union's draft Digital Services Act contains provisions around transparency for researchers. Um, maybe as one sidebar, it's still a bit of a debate who is a researcher, um, because in the current draft, it's only people affiliated with an academic institution. And that then excludes a whole host of people who do research who are not affiliated with the university. So I think there's still big discussions to happen there. You know, what happens to a, a Bellingcat or what happens to civil society organizations where you often have um, some really cutting edge research, but then they technically wouldn't be able to get access to the same sources uh, as we would. So you're right, regulation, it's a huge discussion. It's an important one. Um, and it's one that I think could really change what types of sources uh, we have. And maybe one final thing is that it even um, gets to this question of what is an archive? What are we going to require private platform companies to retain? Um, so that's very important for the historians amongst us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I want to jump into the chat because there's a, a question coming up here uh, when it comes to, um, let's say, perspectives. We need to ask ourselves, where, where do we go with all that now? So one question here is, uh, is the prevalence of visual material in public digital communication a challenge that can be better tackled by journalists? I guess, Peter, this is, uh, <laughs> I know that Heidi wants to say something on that, but maybe, Peter, you can go first. Can journalists do it better? What skills would historians need? Uh, do you have some minutes to, to think about that? But I guess you already have an answer uh, to learn to get up to that speed we face here. But Peter, you first. Um, that, um, I mean, so if, if I'm not sure if I understand the the, um, the question uh, correctly, but the question is if um, this, the new sources, if the if if a research journalist can do a better job than a historian uh, to investigate them, is that and especially I, the visual material? Um, not necessarily. I mean that really depends on the individual researcher, um, how good of an analyst you are. But uh, the question I think would is is better formulated as. Is it more useful for um, the investigator or or the um, historian? So, um, well, um, because history is um, is usually a much longer um, time scale, um, it is not as useful for history yet because it's too recent. Uh, history um, involves much more, uh, much much more sources. So, I. I wouldn't say that it is more um, um, that that an that a invest uh, investigative journalist is is better at it, but um, it is easier to um, limit your research to these sources. Um, as a historian, then people will say, "Well, this is not exactly a history." If you're only working with recent sources on social media, it's not history yet. Perhaps in in, in thirty years, if you're limiting yourself to those sources. Then yes, it is. But uh, as a historian, you would have to. I, I'm not saying that those sources are not useful for a historian. They certainly are. Uh, but then I would say you would have to involve many other sources from the past in order to build a much longer narrative. So um, no, I think for a historian, these sources are definitely useful. Um, but also more. Um, but for an investigative journalist, they are um, um, right now. Um, more relevant in the sense that our work is almost completely dependent on it. 
Heidi, are we still sticking too much to the texts? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is a longer standing debate amongst historians, right, is that um, historians are very attached to the written word and there are all sorts of historians, you know, for example, historians of photography um, or historians of visual material who have long pleaded for us as historians to take this material more seriously, to, to work on our vocabulary, you know, almost to become art historians in a way, to become better at integrating these sources. So, you know, just the top of my, off the top of my head, I, I have a new colleague, Kelly McCormick, who works on the history of photography in Japan, um, Mike and Umbach, Annette Vorwinkel, all sorts of other historians who, who have long thought about this, but I think it's in broad brushstrokes true that we as historians tend to gravitate towards the written word and it's also in broad brushstrokes true that we were going to have to grapple with visual material with videos um, in a way that we haven't before how are we going to write a history of the 2000s without being able to talk about what's going on on instagram right and the way in which people have fashioned their lives around what they photograph um, these are i think important things that we need to grapple with. And there are certainly historians who've worked on things like um, photography and visuality who can help us think about it um, and because we will be unable to write these histories without coming to terms with these questions. And there's many good work out, out there. So, so if you want, as an audience, want to check visual history, sound history, uh, we are, we're going to the census uh, for years now. And, and I guess there are parts in historiography that already have good tools and good materials, good databases and good sources. So it's out there. You may want to check another department if you don't feel comfortable with the department that you have, but there are different good books out there, good work out there and many colleagues that you can access and ask if you want to have uh, certain answers on your own research or if you need help. So just get in touch, uh, Google visual history, Google sound history and get all the stuff that you need. Especially in public history, this I can say for sure, the, uh, the, the experiencing history is very important and that comes to all senses, even to smells, how smells, uh, how, how does the world smell, how does a harbor smell, this is all important. Uh, and it comes to, to all these dimensions we may have forgot for longer times, but we do this. Actually, we do it. It's it's wrong to say we, we don't do this in history. So uh, it's out there. Just find it. Time's running really fast, but I want to come to, to, to the last point that is really important for me. And, and I'm very interested to, to hear your points on that. Um, I mean, we already talked about that we need new competencies, that we need to equip ourselves with skills to, to engage in all these discourses and all those critical propaganda and information wars we have. But on the other hand, how, how should we do that? I, 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 I think I, I really love um, the division of labor. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really a favor to not have to do everything in, in the world because I, I have my job, I have my life and it's complicated to have that. So my last question maybe on to, to you both is how can we retain trust in media outlets? How can we retain trust in professional journalism and historiography? Because we as historians are also contested. And what do you think, what should we learn? What do we need to do to, to get back in touch um, in these discourses and not to lose ground? Do you have an idea, Heidi? Yeah, so maybe I'll just say briefly, you're quite right. Historians too have become uh, contested and in part because we have wanted to put ourselves more into to public discourses over the last um, five to 10 years has become increasingly important to a large number of us. Um, and, and the contested nature of history, you know, in some ways we say history has become much more important again um, in, in the public arena. And one thing that we can do is some of the things we've been talking about, which is think about the different ways that we present history and how we actually interact with publics and, and public questions. Um, while I would say acknowledging that sometimes that comes with danger. Right, um, that, that there are people who have experienced um, death threats and harassment on a huge level. So I think the final thing we also need is um, support from institutions that can actually assure people's safety if they're going to take these kinds of leaps into public discourse. That we actually have some some institutional supports in in different ways to acknowledge that 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 comes with lots of promise, lots of potential, but it can also come with some some dangers as well. Peter, you want to add something here? Um, I would just say that um, 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 that it's important for both historians and investigative journalists is to um, um, to understand that their work is really important. Don't let it uh, be in doubt. As I hear now, um, historians are being contested. Um, 
I think that um, the job remains uh, enormously important. Uh, just as investigative journalists, um, it remains important, even uh, if you look at it cynically in a sense that, oh, we're not going to have newspapers anymore. No, uh, news will be more uh, important than ever. And um, yes, and how to keep the trust. Um, it is uh, for, for those professionals out there who really take their job seriously, is to keep a, also for an investigative journalist, is to keep uh, an objective outlook to keep, um, which um, uh, I would say, actually, I would prefer every investigative journalist to also be interested in history there, because that is what helps me a lot, is to always see the legacy to a conflict that I'm investigating. And um, yes, um, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to add. <laughs> Maybe last line from me here. Um, my thought here is don't give up your institutions that produce safe and sound knowledge, at least at, as good as they can at this very moment. If you lose your institutions, they may not come back easy. And um, maybe that's an important thing to know that uh, even if scientists are wrong, historians can be wrong. Of course they can, journalists can make errors, but uh, in the end we have good systems that produce safe and sound knowledge at its best in the very moment now and we may want to keep that maybe this is the last for me and then i give back to fiona thank you very much heidi thank you very much peter for for taking the time to discuss with me here My yeah, pleasure. Thank, thank you so much thank you so much uh, heidi peter and Horsten, for this exciting opening um, of the e-commemoration convention um, about the future of history um, at least for me, it leaves me with a lot of uh, food for thought, and I'm looking forward uh, to continuing these important discussions tomorrow on day two of our e-commemoration convention. But before uh, we all go to bed or start your day, uh, depending on, on where you're looking uh, or watching us from, um, we have a special treat uh, for all of you because we have secured access to the 2018 film Bellingcat Truth in a Post-Truth World. And the film is available exclusively on our conference platform. And if you're not uh, yet on the platform, get in touch via email and we'll hook you up. So you're set for your evening's entertainment or your day's ent entertainment. Tomorrow, we continue on our conference platform with more amazing speakers, exciting discussions and hands-on sessions. So let's discuss, let's connect and let's do history. At 10.30 Central European time tomorrow, we explore how video games and interactive technology can make the complexity of eyewitness accounts accessible and allow for new perspectives on contested pasts. We're looking forward to seeing you then. And for now, I wish you a pleasant evening or rest of the day. Enjoy watching the film and I hope to see you tomorrow. How is digitalization redefining history? New generations and new technologies pose new questions and call on us to renew our understanding of history. E-commemoration is digital and agile. It is global and multi-perspective. How will the future of history, shaped by algorithms and social media, look like? We connect history and politics and try to make sense of the present by consulting the past. With the commemoration, we want to discuss the opportunities and challenges of digital remembrance. How can digital tools keep historical testimony alive? We want to bring historians, educators, memory workers, digital pioneers and creative minds from all over the world together. This very first e-commemoration convention gives us the opportunity to discuss new perspectives on creative and participatory commemoration. How can technological innovation enable more inclusive perspectives on history? Join us on our conference platform to participate in discussions with renowned speakers, to try out new technologies in our hands-on sessions and to connect with people from across the globe.
Hat euch das Video gefallen? Dann abonniert unseren Kanal, um kein Video zu verpassen. Schaut gern auch in unserer Mediathek vorbei auf körber-stiftung.de slash Mediathek und folgt uns auf Facebook, Instagram und Twitter. Danke fürs Zuschauen und bis bald!